on the one hand, information wants to be expensive because it's so valuable. The right information in the right place just changes your life. On the other hand, information wants to be free because the cost of getting it out is getting lower and lower all the time. Have you heard that quote before? I bet you have. I don't know if you know the origin. I didn't. But it was actually recorded between Stuart Brand and Steve Wozniak at the very first Hackers Conference in 1984. And it's even recorded um, in Getty Images, so you can watch the exchange online. 1984, information wants to be free. I mean, in many ways, don't you think it is? Don't you think today it is? I mean, we just had a chapter conversation chapter 12 with Chris Anderson, right? Head of TED. If you go to TED.com, every single TED Talk is free. You watch this unbelievable high quality content from the latest and greatest and biggest thinkers in the entire world, and it's just free. It's right there. The last chapter, chapter 13, we talked to Ariel Bissett, who is on the forefront of a new revolution in booktubing. Well, what isn't free on YouTube, right? Like all these booktubers and, and YouTubers and all this endless content, it's, it's really free. You don't have to pay for it. And the show you're listening to right now, three books, it's totally free. Everything about this show is free. It is free to listen to. It's free to share. The content, we don't even have the grading ads or sponsors or anything like that. It's just literally free content. So is everything free today? And if it is, I got a big question, which is why is the paid speaking industry actually expanding? Like, why is the value of live increasing? Why, why pay five or six figures to bring in a big name author or athlete into your conference or your school or your corporation when you can just watch the video? It's all free online. I mean, is it because, as one of our three books values, is it because in an era of infinite choice, the value of curation skyrockets? Or is there something more going on here? Maybe when we have more content, we all have less of other things, right? We have less attention. We have less connection. We have less alignment. If you want to get a room full of people excited about one thing, it's hard to do that unless you all talk about that one thing for a set period of time. And you feel that one thing together. Something's going on because all this content is free everywhere, yet the value of live is going up. The value of going to a concert, right? Concert tickets are super expensive, as you know. And it's like, we all still want to go to the show, even though the music is just endlessly streaming everywhere we can press a button. Well, nobody knows this better, in my opinion, than Rich Gibbons, right? Rich is the CEO of Speak Inc., the largest speaking bureau in the Western United States, which is the world's largest market for paid corporate or commercial speakers. In addition, Rich was the past president of the International Association of Speaking Bureaus. And beyond that, maybe more importantly, which is really why I wanted him on the show, why I think of him inspiring, he's one of the most interesting and articulate people I've ever met. He's like this human sponge who's constantly wading through endless spews of sewage to find the gold and bring it forward for all of us. We talk a lot in this show about a number of things. How do you break into this speaking industry? What separates those who succeed from those who don't? And beyond that, we get into that sponge in Rich's brain, that articulate sponge, I like to think of it, and we get into the things he's thinking about, he's focused on, and we get into his three books. We touch on a number of themes which made me thinking, left my head scratching, and made me kind of want to be a better parent. You'll hear why. One of the books is a parenting book. You, you, you'll hear a book that made me feel really grateful um, as we get a window into a society on this planet that has just lost everything. And the window is really remarkable and focused, and it's something that I would not have got if I hadn't read this book. But enough of a tease, enough of me. Let's turn things over to Rich Gibbons. I hope you enjoy this very special chapter of Three Bucks. Hey, Rich. Hey, Neil. <laughs> I just pressed record, so you're good to go. All right. And where I see are, the like, red button. The red button is on. It's bright. It's going to keep telling us that we're recording. And I'm, I'm sitting in your office uh, looking out at what? Where, where am I? You're in Scripps Ranch, which is a, a suburb of San Diego, California. And it's another beautiful San Diego day. Yeah, this has got the highest number of days of sunshine a year. 
of any yeah. city in the U.S. Is that right? I've heard like 360 yeah. days I, a yeah, year. Yeah, I think like I that. think that's right. I recently was in Boston as we were talking earlier, and there was one day in particular where it was 37 and pouring rain. <laughs> and it was very validating to call uh, San Diego home. I know. You make everybody jealous, yeah. which is maybe why I keep spending so much time down here. Um, <laughs> but it's a beautiful place. And I, I really appreciate you taking some time in the Speak Inc. office uh, to chat with me about books. Oh, all I, I so appreciate being invited and the, the list of uh, august uh, <laughs> guests you've had uh, so far. I'm humbled to be asked. <laughs> well, you were, you were part of the... Did you say august? I think I did. How do you say that? What does that word mean? Uh, I think it means um, uh, important. Um, yeah, now you're asking me to define it. Well, I, I, just because you're so articulate, I, now I want to know. Uh, uh, you should talk to my wife. She knows I'm not articulate. <laughs> important, though. Okay. You're, you're, there's, I, I, I'm going to get back to you with a definition on that. <laughs> we could pause and look it up, but we'll just go with important. That's fine. Um, so you're the first person I've ever had on three bucks who's in this speaking industry. So I thought before we start talking about books, you could just help us out with a couple questions, which are, sure. what is the speaking industry? Why does it exist? And who are the players in this ecosystem? So this is for people that like, you know, it's, and, and like, this is where I was when, before I started giving speeches. Like I knew nothing about this industry. I found it like mm -hmm. totally opaque. Like you mm -hmm. can't just like Google it and figure it out. So give us a little window, a little light into this speaking industry. Yeah, I suppose for, for people out there that don't attend either a corporate meeting or a trade association event, uh, for those that do, they're, they're familiar with uh, the, the, the thought leaders and the people on the platform that are uh, you know, moving hearts and minds. But uh, yeah, there's all kinds of uh, uh, authors, um, uh, lots of uh, uh, people that have an area of expertise or life experience that uh, other people can uh, learn from. And uh, yeah, there's a very vigorous market on both the corporate and trade association side for those kinds of uh, compelling presenters. The way we fall, our, you know, our Speakers Bureau and a lot of my friends in the industry, the way we add value to the landscape is helping uh, buyers that are an event stakeholders that may be uh, new to the landscape, new to the circuit, not really understand the ins and outs. And uh, we can provide, uh, quote unquote, the adult supervision that they need to make intelligent uh, selections. And we can make suggestions based on the criteria that they give us. So it sounds like, so you go to a conference, there's a bunch of, you know, there's fancy dinners, there's a black tie night, there's the head of the company giving a over industry overview or like a next year ahead. And then you've also got this like external speakers, what you guys are representing external speakers like Malcolm Gladwell comes in or, right. you know, uh, Kobe Bryant comes in or, or, or whoever, and you represent them. And so, um, but, but like, to me, the big question I have is like, why, like, why is this, why is it not all on big TVs? Like why, every Ted talk is free. Mm -hmm. Like, why is it in this era of endless video, everything, is there still a market in fact, it sounds like it's growing for live. We want Malcolm Gladwell himself on our stage, and we're willing to pay, you right. know, six figures for that. Right. right. Well, as you and I discussed recently, uh, I, I was told many, many years ago, almost 30 years ago now, that uh, with holograms and all these uh, new technologies, that the, the the world of professional speaking and live uh, presentations was likely going to go the way of the buggy whip. It was going to be extinct <laughs> pretty soon. And, and of course, the, the longer uh, we are involved in the industry and the medium, the more we realize that that human connection is really more important now than it ever was. Yeah. Uh, and there's just a certain intangible magic to experiencing um, a you know somebody who is incredibly uh, compelling. Uh, and just uh, really moving to to hear that uh, live and in the flesh. There's just something. You know, it's like you, you can watch a comedian on television. There's something about being in the club, listening to a comedian, yeah. and everybody's crying with laughter together. That's a totally, totally different experience. It's like Spotify doesn't kill concerts. Exactly. Right. It's, it's probably adjunct to it, and yeah. and uh, the irony of uh, Spotify. I. I got an email from Spotify the other day and it had two musicians and a comedian that I listened to a lot. And it said, hey, these performers are going to be coming to San Diego in the next two, three months. And I'm looking at it, you know, like I'm pretty dim witted. I'm looking at it like, how do they know? How did they know that was, and of course, it's just big data. 
Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it probably amplifies mm-hmm. to some degree. I wouldn't have even, I might not have even sought out those concerts if it wasn't for Spotify tapping me on the shoulder. Totally. You might not even know how to, I mean, it's hard to find tickets to who was coming to town and all that stuff. Right. And you know, I, we have this value on three books. It's called in an era of infinite choice, the value of curation skyrockets. It's why this show is called three books We have a thousand mm-hmm. books come out a day, but we're interested in your specific three most formative books. Am I right in saying that, you know, I'm part of the nature of what your role is, is also curation from the sea of, of people, but also we also want curated experiences. So like mm-hmm. everyone's on their cell phones a million minutes a day. So if we're all sitting in a room paying attention to one stage, then we, the organization or we, the team or whatever, we move somewhere together when that's something that seems worthwhile too. Right. Well, it, 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 the other thing that, uh, you, you know, you and I talked about it a little earlier that, of the the various values uh, on your podcast, the one that just hit me right between the eyes was that the value of curation skyrockets, and uh, the notion that we have a finite, uh, you know, the, how many did you say? A thousand new books come out a day? Yeah, well, five hundred thousand books come out a year. Yeah, I mean, that that's a comical number. Um, but the the notion that you would be able to uh, consume most of those is comical. So if you say, okay, well, it is a finite number that I can absorb. I better make sure they're really, really good. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we were talking earlier about how, um, you know, the, the, the books that make largely the most impact on us are the ones that a friend, a family member, a coworker has come to you foaming at the mouth mm-hmm. saying, oh my God, you've got to read this book. It's absolutely phenomenal. Those are the ones that make it to the nightstand. They make it to the audiobook list. Um, and, and by and large, the, those are the books that really make a big imprint on you. Um, what was the second thing that you- No, no, you, we were just chatting about like how, how sort of if you're in a room together, you all move somewhere at the same time. Right. It's like when you're going down the Whitewater Rapids at, in the Grand Canyon, we, the people, had a growth yeah. opportunity. And I was thinking yeah. perhaps a value out of live is that the room shifts somewhere. More yeah. than like, I read this great book, you should read it. Right. It's more like we all heard Jim Collins talking yeah. about good to great. So we right. all decide – Hey, as an organization, right. we get to move together. We, we, yeah, we had a shared experience, and it was uh, it was something. It was a moment in time that we we all had in common. The the, the thing you also mentioned was the value of curation yeah. in our industry, and that absolutely is true because um, because we have a really long view of it. You know, we've got not days and weeks, but months and years, and for the really old ones, decades in, in the business, and really have a great sense of. Um, those uh, thought leaders and practitioners that really lean into their work and have a passion around it and do the thousand little things behind the scenes that really make for a phenomenal program and a phenomenal experience for the attendee and the event stakeholders. So that's where the curation component in Mm -hmm. our industry really has a a big part. See, in the book industry, people always say, how do I get a publisher? And I always say, it's about actually getting a literary agent. Because the literary agent is the one that is front facing to the author. They get, you know, hundreds and hundreds of submissions mm-hmm. that's in this thing called a slush pile mm-hmm. and then query letters. And then they like find the good ones and they take that gold to the publisher's front door. And the publisher is usually like, good. Like your job was accomplished. You were the bird right. in the alligator's teeth. You've mm-hmm. you filtered out the crap right. and you get to bring in the gold. And the publisher publishes the gold. Yeah. So so for those listening who are aspiring speakers. How do they get in the front door of a, of a filter mechanism like you guys, curation mechanism, yeah. so that they become one of the speakers that you then recommend? Like, what does that look like for anyone listening who's aspiring to be um, sharing their messages on yeah, well, big it, stages it, for lots of money? There is a little bit of a catch-22 there because a lot of the um, uh, event organizers and stakeholders are inherently risk-averse. They're spending a lot of money. Uh, you know, in the corporate setting, they're taking a lot of people offline for a two, three day conference. You've got the cost of the conference. You've got the cost of the people's time. It's a big, big footprint. Uh, so they don't want every minute of that conference is super important and they don't want to take chances. Um, because, uh, agents like myself and my colleagues in the bureau industry want to have long and enduring and loyal client relationships, uh, because that serves everybody best. Um, we're risk averse too. We don't want to take any chances with that, uh, with that slot. So anything that, um, a a speaker can do to, um, 
uh, assuage the, the concern on the part of either the event stakeholder or the bureau agent uh, will certainly put the wind at their back. But I think you know, you're probably a, a, an embodiment of the, uh, the, the, the phenotype of person that pursues things that are truly interesting and, and it's their, they, they didn't wake up one day and say, I'm going to be an expert on topic X. There's a little bit of, you know, I never planned on doing, I, I never planned on having this journey, but it sort of selected me. And I think that those are the people who uh, really rise to the top because they're coming at it with a bit of a servant's heart and truly making a difference when they when they get on a platform, as opposed to, uh, gosh, you know, what are the three most hot topics that I should be oh, speaking yeah. about? Because yeah. to me, that's the tail wagging the dog. Suddenly, I'm uh, the master of cryptocurrency. Right, <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. You really need to be authentic, yeah. and uh, and then I, I, you know, if I think if you compare audiences of 20, 30 years ago compared to today. And, and I don't I don't mean it to be a pejorative uh, remark on Zig Ziglar, but sort of the 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 era in which he came of age and, and was really successful. I think that there's a, a great deal more circumspection and a bit more of a jaded attitude on the part of a lot of audiences. You know, why are you legitimate or authentic on this topic? And what are you possibly going to tell me that I don't already know? Mm -hmm. um, so the people that can really come to it with a, a, a giving heart and uh, a curious intellectual curiosity um, are the ones that audiences and, and humility. That's the, that's the one thing that I see um, anytime a, a, a presenter engages in self-deprecation or tells a funny story at their own expense, the audience just opens up like a, like a flower. They're just mm -hmm. so thrilled that it's not somebody beating their chest, uh, talking about how they're a superhero, that I'm human like you. I fell on my face a few times and, uh, this is what I learned from it. And that's, that's a, that's a different vibe. Cool. Uh, well, I, I want you are an inspiring individual, Rich Gibbons, and that's why I wanted you on the show. And I also just love you're a poor judge of character. Well, no, I actually just love listening to you because you've got this amazing vocabulary. You just like throw these words out the pejorative, opening like a flower. What was that you mentioned a word a second? Ago. I wish I'd written it down. But you've got this. I just love your descriptions of things, which is why I thought I need to have your three most formative books on this show. I really, really want to hear you talk about them. I'm so, so curious because you're so interesting to listen to and you've got such an articulate way of talking. Well, again, I'm, I'm humbled that you, you would ask. You and, are in the it, speaking industry, so I guess you have to be a good speaker. Uh, yeah, but I don't do the speaking. I just, uh, <laughs> I just book them. Um, and this, this actually was when you first approached me about this, I thought um, that's a, that what, what a, what an interesting concept and what a fun endeavor. And it was, uh, it was a lot harder than I originally expected. Oh, finding your three most formative books. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, good. Well, that's a nice segue into yeah. revealing one of them. And we've got all three in front of us. Why don't you point to me which uh, which one you want to start with because I can go in any order you want that one okay so we are going to start book number one and I'm going to just get, I'll give the listeners just like a, a sort of a one minute overview of the book before I ask you to tell us about your relationship with mm -hmm. them so they can kind of picture it sure so I'm holding it in my hand it's a white book nonfiction. it's called nothing to envy ordinary lives in North Korea by Barbara Demick on the cover there's a big silver sticker that says national book award finalist. The back of the book reads, award-winning journalist Barbara Demick follows the lives of six North Korean citizens over 15 years, a chaotic period that saw the death of Kim Il-sung, the rise to power of his son Kim Jong-il, and a devastating famine that killed one-fifth of the population. Demick brings to life what it means to be living under the most repressive totalitarian regime today, an Orwellian world that is by choice not connected to the internet, where displays of affection are punished, informants are rewarded, and an offhand remark can send a person to the gulag for life. This book was published in 2009 by Spiegel and Grau, a division of Random House, a division of Penguin Random House. And the amazing thing about this book, uh, or at least the history of it, was that, you know, Korea, Korea was ruled by the, the Chosun dynasty, if I'm saying that right, for 1,200 years. Japan then occupied Korea from 1910 to 1945. After Japan's surrender in World War II, the United States was worried about a power vacuum in Korea and thought the Soviets would try to take over 
and as they were already approaching from the north. So they drew a line on a map in Washington, D.C., randomly on the 38th parallel, a line that had no history or bearing to anything in Korea before. They gave the north to the Soviets to appease them, and they look at the south. This book opens with a stark image of South Korea covered in lights and North Korea totally black. And the opening paragraph, and I'm going to transition it to you after this, Rich. The opening paragraph is, if you look at a satellite photograph of the Far East by night, you'll see a large splotch curiously lacking in light. This area of darkness is the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, North Korea. When outsiders stare into the void that is today's North Korea, they think of remote villages of Africa or Southeast Asia where the civilizing hand of electricity is not yet reached. But North Korea is not an undeveloped country. It is a country that has fallen out of the developed world with skeletal wires and rusted electrical grids that once covered the entire country hanging everywhere. Nothing to envy by Barbara Demick. Tell us about your relationship with this fascinating book. Yeah. And I just heard the other day that um, when the armistice was signed uh, in 1953, I believe, um, the 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 30th parallel and the DMZ and that entire infrastructure uh here we are in 2018 it has not changed one iota huh. i can't i'm not good at math i don't know how long ago that was but uh it's really long yeah uh um, like 60 years that 71 years uh okay well we're um we'll have to we'll have to get a calculator out <laughs> Um, but I, you know, so th- th- there's obviously uh, there's a lot that's been written about Korea and uh, a lot that's been written about North Korea. I mean, this is certainly not the only one. Uh, Demick was the LA Times uh, correspondent in Seoul, mm. and she had this access to these nine uh, defectors from North Korea. And I think I sent to you recently that um, I was at a buddy's house not long ago, and he had that Mark Twain quote on his fridge oh, that yeah. travel being. Um, uh, travel having this sort of injurious effect on bigotry and small mindedness, and 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 a book is certainly not travel, but it can. I think to some degree it can be transporting um, mentally, and to I think the the idea that you can get a better perspective on your own country and culture and people and and the fabric of your life through the lens of uh, some far off place. Uh, that's what this book did for me, and the level of just deprivation and uh, societal dysfunction and uh, uh, lack of commercial opportunity. I mean, just goes on and on and on. And Demick does a great job of giving a real granular sense of that yeah. in the day to day lives. It's about of these people, people. It's about boyfriends and girlfriends falling in love with no power, and they just walk through pitch black in the middle of the night, right? And kind of hold hands and right. how there's no sex education and they kind of talks to them about the, the the fact that they don't celebrate their own birthdays. They celebrate only the birthday of the leader. And the, right. You know, it's just, the right. portrait is so, as you, you call it granular, but you're right inside people's homes. Yeah. It, it, and and the, the one that really blew, there were a couple of things that really just leaped out at me. And, and I find also, you know, your question was, you know, hey, Gibbons, what were the three most formative books? And I, I got to thinking, well, what are the books that I, as an adult, uh, you know, I think to, to some degree, as uh, elementary school, secondary school, collegiate, your, your experience there is more that you're, you're almost force fed. You know, you got to read the Iliad and you got to read uh, Catcher in the Rye. And, and not that those are bad books, but there's something about having that uh, elective opportunity to consume something as opposed to somebody telling you to, uh, to read it. Um, so, uh, you know, I look at my experience to date and the ones that I, I got to thinking, well, what books do I talk about a lot? What books do I recommend a lot? Clearly, those are books that had an impression on how I view the world and how I just think about a lot of a lot of things. I mean, this is uh, probably more of a geopolitical. This is, uh, it's a big book. It's a heavy book. It's a dense book. It's about it's about a pre- an oppressor. Who should like who should read this book? You made the parallel to Twain and traveling. Is is yeah. you think it's it's a get out of your own head type book or who who should yeah, read this? I, I, well, I think it's a get out of your own head type book, and uh, I think given the current political climate in the United States, it's it's also a a, a, a good context defining book by virtue of the fact that um, you know a lot of my friends and family hear me say um, uh, you know. It, 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 if you think it's tough living here, if you think uh, you know, current administration or you know this 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 country's going to hell in a burning chariot, um, why don't you go live in North Korea for a year and 
or, or any other uh, incredibly backward, uh, you know, depressed, dysfunctional society, and then come back and, and tell me what you think. And, uh, you know, this country is not perfect by any means, but this is uh, in lieu of a plane ticket. Uh, if you can invest the time to read something like this, it really provides a new context and framework for thinking about the freedoms that I think a lot of us take for granted. Yeah. Um, the, one of the, the one of the tales out of this book that just blew my mind was uh, you, you have to wait some insane length of time to get a radio, and you have to wait twice as long to get a television. And of course, when they deliver the television to you, the tuner is locked into it's like super glued into uh, state fed propaganda. And then when they put the television back together, they uh, they close it up with security tape. And you're not to touch the security tape once they deliver the television to you. And to ensure that that happens, they have somebody from the Ministry of Information or whatever ministry it is to do uh, surprise pop-in visits to inspect the tape. Um, that just seems like insanity to me. Yeah, uh, it is. But that's, that's normal life there. Yeah. And... and it's just one of dozens and dozens and dozens of, of stories and anecdotes and observations that she has about the the daily lives of uh, the, the people of this country. Yeah. You know, one author I think you and I both love is David Sedaris. Yes. And I remember reading an interview with him a long time ago, and he said, you know, when I was younger, I would read like a deep, you know, portrait, like, like this book, Nothing to Envy, but like in the Atlantic, like the magazine version. And then he said, I'd lie on the couch crippled for the rest of the night, yeah. totally unable to function because I could do nothing about it. And just the story would get so deep and so painful. Mm -hmm. And yet it's one of your most formative books. And you're not unusual. People have recommended on this show, like books like, you know, Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Mm -hmm. There's been like mm -hmm. a day in the life of Ivanisevich, like these heavy, dark books. So it's like, my question is, what do you do after you read the book? Hey, it's a very good question. Um, you know, when you read a, uh, when you read something like that, it really makes you feel a little a little small, and your your reach, uh, you know, no matter how motivated you are, is probably pretty ineffectual. But um, you know, at the very at the very least, I think it helps you um, uh, it helps you conceive of. Uh, the, the, we, we, we talk about gratitude and yeah. how important um, embracing gratitude is in your worldview. And I think something like this, for me personally, and again, you know, different strokes for different folks, but for me personally, it really uh, gave me sort of a, a forced intimacy with all the ways in which we can uh, live our lives in a, in a free country. And we can go out in a public place and say that we think our president is a complete idiot. And no one's going to lock us away. I mean, there, there are a lot of conspiracy theories out there. But uh, by and large, you can go, uh, you, can, you can write about, you can speak about, you can protest. Uh, and you do not end up in a gulag. Um, th there's another scene in the, in the book where um, the father, uh, Kim Jong-il, uh, dies – yeah, and there are uh, officials, state officials, that are sort of lurking in the shadows, seeing who is uh, prostrating themselves at the foot of this big statue, uh, in um, uh, unhinged grief and sobbing, and who looks a little more disaffected and dispassionate on the side. And if you don't look like you're grieving enough, you could maybe be brought in for questioning, or I, I don't know what they do, but the fact that uh, w that's just not something we have to do here mm -hmm. is uh, that there are just a lot of very uh, rubber meets the road examples of that in the book that really help to just frame how we live and a lot that we should be grateful mm -hmm. for, but a lot of the dialogue uh, that I hear that makes me bristle, and again, this is just my opinion, but it makes me bristle, uh, is, you know, I, I wish more people had a window onto this level of um, deprivation totally. and dysfunction. You know, it's so interesting. I, I read the graphic novel recently called Pyongyang, uh, written by Guy Delisle. I don't know if you know uh, him or not. Graphic novelist, uh, French. I don't know if he's, uh, I believe he's from Quebec in Canada. 
and he's written a book called Jerusalem as well. And he kind of catalogs it as like, it's like a travel graphic novel. Mm -hmm. But the book Pyongyang was like, he was transferred there as like an animator from France, I, I think at the time. Uh -huh. And he's in the capital in a building that has like, you know, no food and like some basics. So it's a really like outsider's view of visiting North Korea. Whereas yeah. this book, Nothing to Envy by Barbara, Barbara Demick is like the total opposite. It's like not in the capital, in like a far north town right. with, with a bunch of profiles. So it's like so, so vivid. Yeah. I'm sure that's why it's one of these, it's, you know, covered in awards. Yeah. And it's, it's because it's like it totally, you know, it's what we say on the show. A reader lives a thousand lives before he dies. Right. This reading this book is like totally living another life. Yeah, it, it really yeah. is. It really is. Um, thank you. So now let's go into your second most formative book. Um, we are gonna go with the thank you for pointing at the one you wanted to talk about. I should usually before I start, by the way, for those listening, the uh the 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 fan clubbers, you know, I ask the the person I'm interviewing, what order do you want to go in? My instinct is to go chronological by the person's life. But that doesn't always align with chronological by the book's publication date. Mm -hmm. So as I'm preparing for the interview, I actually don't know what order they read them in or what order it formed you. Right. So now we're going to go to book number I'm, two. I'm not even sure I know the order. I read okay, well, either, well, so. we'll go with this one. Yeah, this is um, the blessing of a skinned knee, using Jewish teachings to raise self-reliant children by Wendy Mogul, a PhD and clinical psychologist. It was published in 2001 by Scribner, a division of Simon & Schuster. Uh, so the description is a clinical psychologist and Jewish educator uses the Torah and other Jewish texts to offer practical insights into developing realistic expectations, teaching respect for adults, dealing with frustration, and enhancing independence. It's a parenting book with the larger lesson that children need to fend for themselves and not be so coddled. I love the blur buried inside by Carrie Fisher, like Princess Leia gave a blurb for this book, and says... The book teaches you how to raise a child to be a good person, not just raise a child to feel good. Great for Jewish, Presbyterian, Buddhists, and skeptics alike. What is your? Tell us about your relationship with The Blessing of a Skinned Knee by Wendy Mogul, M-O-G-E-L. Well, first of all, this uh, book was recommended to me by uh, one of my uh, dear and old friends, Ruth, who is a, a great parent in her own right. Uh, but again, when you said formative, I thought, well, what, what books do I talk about a lot? Do I draw from? And uh, as a parent of a, a, a 16, 14, and newly minted 11-year-old, um, he just had his birthday, um, this is something that my wife and I think a lot about. We both read it, and we both uh, draw from it. Um, and just by way of background, when you're reading that description, I was thinking, wow, it sounds very... Uh, it sounds sort of steeped in dogma and religion, but it's really it, it's really not. And her story, I found very interesting in that she grew up in the Judaic tradition, but as a young adult, sort of distanced herself from that. She uh, she got her uh, master's in counseling or whatever it was, and was practicing in Beverly Hills and seeing these uh, families coming in. To use her word, it, it really it really struck me. She used the word uh, when seeing these teenagers and husbands and and mothers, and that everybody was uh, bathing in affluent. Uh, it, it was a very affluent neighborhood. Of course, they had all the trappings of success, but they seemed, to use her word, unmoored, that they didn't have a connection, a, um, a contentment about the way they lived their lives. Um, and the more she practiced and the more she observed this, they're living in the land of plenty, but they, they're poor souls, uh, that she realized that there was real, uh, there was ancient wisdom in a lot of these, uh, in her case, rabbinical teachings, and you know, regardless of uh, your your background and your sort of religious tradition, that there is this rebound from secularism. That there is a place in uh, our lives as human beings yeah. for uh, ritual and connection and a way to think about some of the the deeper questions. But what really struck me about this book was how practical the, uh, the perspective was around uh, to, to uh, the, there's another title that uh, is more recent, but how to raise an adult 
uh, mm. that we're not raising children. We're trying to raise human beings to become responsible, personally accountable adults. Uh, and a lot of what she uh, talks about in there is drawing on timeless wisdoms that are thousands of years old, but overlaid you know, in a modern context. And uh, there's a there's a there's some there's ballast around that that this is a an idea or a concept that has stood the test of time. Yeah, and not you know weeks and months, thousands but of years, centuries and centuries of uh, thousands of years. So uh, it, it, there's some uh, there, there's an element of uh, sometimes when you read a, a book in this genre, you feel like you're gyrating with. Uh, approach du jour that uh, you're 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 constantly and I've read a lot of those where this feels very different from the last book I read and now this book con there is contrarian to cry your baby to sleep always hold your baby yeah, yeah, there's the baby. always so yeah there's always some sort of prescription stuff. that yeah. ends up being uh, running counter to something else that you've read and there was just something very uh, very. Uh, I, I want to say ancient, uh, that's not the right word, but they're, they're just something very timeless and um, a, a feeling of reliability around mm -hmm. this, that these teachings blended with the modern world uh, to approach some of these pesky, I mean, so, you're, you're a parent so what are too. A couple, what are a couple of things you took from the book that you do in your house now? You're a dad, you got two teenagers and one almost teen. Yeah. Is there anything you can you can say from formatively, you know, that you you know, do as a father from from... From this book, well, the the one thing I think um, there, there's a lot of work out now around the notion that in, in modern society, parents have uh, evolved from helicopter parent, you know, hovering over their children, making sure that nothing ill uh, comes of them, to the lawnmower parent, like let me get down at the at the ground level and um, hack a, a clean path through the undergrowth so that child doesn't get any scratches or a skin knee. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea that there are lessons to be learned from failure and there's, uh, there's lessons to be learned from not doing it perfectly, uh, that I think we've been trained to strive for perfection and strive for uh, the, the perfect outcome. And parenting, obviously, you're a parent, yeah. you know that it's very messy business. Yeah. Uh, it's very unpredictable. Uh, your your kids can uh, eat the same food. They come from the same genetic material, and they're all completely different. Totally, um, it's a great so. title too. The blessing of a skinned knee, and her her follow up book is called The Blessing of a B minus, which is yeah. about raising teenagers before college. Yeah. I thought, Rich, what Extension. we could do uh, on this book because it's such a fascinating book, The Blessing of a Skinned Knee. And by the way, I noticed interestingly that the 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 way I got the research was from the internet and says using Jewish teachings to raise self-reliant children. But the way I bought the book is I bought a new book and they've actually changed the subtitle to yeah. using timeless teachings to raise self-reliant children. So they actually took the word Jewish out of the title. I don't know if that was for a specific purpose or not. We can speculate. Yeah. And, and you, yeah, you can speculate. I, I think that timeless is, uh, I mean, Jewish is probably uh, applicable, but timeless, I think, is much more relevant in that these are um, these are ideas and concepts that have stood the test of time, mm -hmm. you know, th 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 and they're uh, they're reliable. Yeah, one of the ones in the book is parents are the boss, kind of like your house isn't a democracy. They talk about this couple that came into her counseling and the, you know, there's toys everywhere. And like, it's kind of like the family takes a vote on everything. And like, yeah, they decide like, I'm not going to have this for dinner. And like, I don't want to go to sleep right now. I want to watch one more show. And she's yeah. like, a big thing in this book is no parents are the boss. Right. Like I, I might, I'm not, I'm paraphrasing it. Like yeah, I, yeah. that's not the word she yeah. uses something more polite, but like that was a really good message for me to hear yeah. with a kid doing a lot of those things right now. In I, my I, I have a really good friend, Tim, a very old dear friend, Tim, who uh, uh, when he was getting some uh, backlash from his kids and he and his wife were very successful parents and uh, he was explaining to one of his children from whom he was getting a little bit of pushback, um, you need to understand this family is a benevolent dictatorship. <laughs> Uh, you know, we want what's best, the, the message being, we want what's best for you, but we're going to tell you how it is. You know, it, it, there's another book um, where they talk about parents uh, falling into that trap of being desirous of being their, their son or daughter's friend. Yeah. And uh, the author says, 
the last thing in the world your child needs are two more really tall friends. <laughs> That's hilarious. A couple quotes from the book that I would like your reflection on is, if your child has a talent to be a baker, don't tell him to be a doctor. Yeah. Have you I, tried to follow that as a dad? Your, uh, I don't know if any of my kids are into baking. A, no, but, not particular, uh, but I just mean like, you know, we have I, such a flipped. we have such a bias towards these success outcomes sure. for our children. Sure, sure. At least Indian. I, you know, I had the sort of it, invisible pressure to be a doctor my whole life. Right, right, right. Yeah. No, I, well, I, I, I can't remember if I, I took it from uh, that book or not, but, you know, I think m the, the perspective that my wife and I have is that um, if you can give your children a lot of different experiences and sort of, you know, take them down the buffet line of life and give them a scoop of this and a helping of that, and eventually they're going to discover, boy, you know, I really hate this, but uh, I really... I feel like I found my uh, natural calling in that, and who knows whether it's it's um, sports or academics or whatever it may be. But to to the point of uh, was it Baker and yeah, uh, doctor, yeah, Baker and if doctor. If a child has that, a talent to be a baker, don't tell him to be a doctor. Right, right. It sounds great on paper though, Rich. But the thing is, like, I read this book recently called "The Opposite of Spoiled," okay, which is written by the New York Times kind of like you know money columnist about how to raise children in families that are middle class or above mm -hmm. where the kids are not spoiled. And one thing he says is that people come talk to them all the time, especially people that are from wealthier families, and they are worried that their child will not achieve their own standard of living, mm -hmm. right? So they have this worry, these, these parents. And we can look at these people, we can mock them, we can kind of have these funny eyebrows and be like, oh, it must be hard. But the point is like, this is a concern right now in life. And this book is saying, if your kid wants to be a baker, let them be a baker, not a doctor. How do you balance that? You're a successful guy, you're president of this company. How do you balance that with, of course, the deep-seated desire as a dad to also want them to be financially successful, not to say that a baker can't be, but ha have them be financially successful, have them to be like, you know, achieving a level of, of, you know, you, what you want for your kids is a life as good or better than your own. Yeah. So if you're a dad or a parent and you have a good life as yeah. ever, however you measured that, there's a pressure here that yeah. you feel to give your kids as good a life or better. How do you balance that with also, you know, well, from my personal experience, I worked briefly in uh, the legal profession, and I saw uh, some of these newly minted JDs that were coming out of the top law schools and going to work on Wall Street, and they were saddled with all kinds of uh, student debt. And they had, on paper, they had these amazing potential, this was a great runway toward partnership at some nice white shoe law firms in New York City. Uh, and on paper, it it should have been sort of the runway to success. And they were out of their minds miserable. So, uh, you know, I, I look at that as kind of a metaphor for, uh, and it's, it's almost gotten hackneyed now to say, oh, I just want my kids to be happy. Mm -hmm. But if uh, you reach that level of, uh, you know, the, the, the doctor, the lawyer, uh, and they're, they're stressed out. They can't maintain relationships. Uh, they, they really don't have uh, satisfaction with their life. What kind of success is that? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, and there's something also baked in there that I can't quite seem to unwind into a question, which is about like, you know, living in a world where, you know, for so many generations, I think most people, if you look at 19, the 1950s to today, we have triple the wealth on average, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that we even on relative terms. But living in a very wealthy society today, um, if people are listening to this, you have the time to listen to it. You have the ability to right. download this. You might have probably an iPhone or an Overcast app. Like you have, you're already really lucky is what I'm trying to say. You know, world right. average income is five grand. Okay, that's a world average income for the year. Five thousand yeah. dollars, and and only seven percent of people get a college education, right? Like, so we're already really, really lucky. A lot of the people that are listening to this. So then it's like maybe we just have to get more comfortable. With what you're saying, it's like happiness over quantifiable success, and also going up and down mm -hmm. instead of just a, a constant upwards ratcheting. Mm -hmm. it's, it's exhausting. How much yeah. better can life get? Right, right. Yeah, it. it I was uh, having a conversation with my wife Heather recently, and. Uh, we were sort of talking around, uh, you know, everybody has finite resources. And uh, 
it's about you know priorities and and you know how you want to live your life. But I forget what the segue was, but I remember uh, saying you know when you look on that global scale of five thousand dollars a year and seven percent you know have a university education. Um, it's like you're in the, we're in the building of the planet and it's a hundred story building and we're on the 99th floor looking up at the hundredth floor thinking, oh, wow, it'd be really fun to be up there. Um, and that, I mean, it kind of comes back to that, uh, that Barbara Demick book that mm -hmm. having a, a perspective of the 98th floor and down, uh, I think is, a is, is one that we should be a, a bit more open to and expose ourselves to more. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So two books offering two, you know, strong perspectives and views on life, which is a nice segue into another strong viewed nonfiction book, your third here, Rich, which I won't ask you which one you want to have next because there's only one book left. So I know which one you want. Hobson's Choice. <laughs> it's called, what does that mean, Hobson's Choice? Uh, there is no choice. Hobson's Choice? I think so, yeah. Oh, cool. Well, this is where I get to keep asking what you, I the words you- I can that one up too. No, the words you keep saying, keep you expand yeah. my, my uh, vocabulary. So your third book is On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft by Stephen King. Published in 2000 by Scribner as well, a division of Simon & Schuster. This is the immensely helpful and illuminating guidebook to any writer. Stephen King's critically lauded million-copy bestseller shares the experiences, habits, and convictions that have shaped him and his work. Stephen King takes readers through the crucial aspects of the writer's art and life, offering practical and inspiring advice on everything from plot and character development to work habits and rejection. Tell us about your relationship with On Writing – by Stephen King. That book was recommended to me by a buddy of mine, Ross, and uh, I, I guess, to some extent, each of these books has its own little uh, sort of fiefdom of impact on me and, <laughs> and who who I am. Fiefdom and, of impact. And you know, we spend so much of our lives trying to. Uh, trying to transport the ideas that germinate in our head through our fingertips, through a keyboard, into a computer, and then they go from me to you. And if I do that well, you understand uh, my tone, uh, you understand my ideas, you understand my sentiment. Uh, and if I do it poorly, it's probably just going to confuse you, frustrate you, uh, and it's not a very satisfying. Um, it's not a very satisfying endeavor as a writer. Um, you're obviously a very, very prolific writer. Uh, I would love to get your take on this book. But the thing I loved about it too, I mean, there's so many aspects of, of the book that uh, were meaningful to me. One of which was, you know, love or hate his genre. I, it's I, ironically, I. You're talking about I, horror. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like his genre does not, I, I don't like that, but you really can't argue with the critical success and the, he's just an incredibly prolific writer and successful writer. And he's so impassioned about the, the, the practice, the mental approach, the mechanics of it, uh, and how to convey your ideas with clarity and impact. Uh, but he doesn't pull any punches. He's very energized around, and, and it's delivered in this sort of uh, sort of cynical baby boomer snark that mm -hmm. I I get a big kick out of too. Um, Somebody said it's like reading a letter from a friend. Like it's it's also very intimate. The writing it, it of the book. is yeah. it is that that's exactly right. Um, so the, the, one of the elements of it that you know I, I think of the content frequently, and he obviously is a big lover of Strunk and White's uh, elements of style and uh, writing with. Which uh, I noticed you brought with you today. Precision. I, I found <laughs> that in a pile of books the other day, and I thought, oh, I got to bust that out for Neil. Um, but the the amazing thing to me was that uh, he, you know, there's, there's a little bit of of your life experience and what he did, and that. You hear him working these horrendous side jobs. Uh, I don't know if you – there's one in particular where he's working at a laundry uh, that is taking the tablecloths and napkins from uh, seafood restaurants oh, in yeah. Maine. And they're these rancid – I won't get into the description, but I mean just about the worst job you can possibly imagine – but he's doing that. He's grinding through that job, but he's writing all the time. He never stops writing. It's like a, it's just this fire inside him that he can't put out. Uh, but the amount of rejection that he 
uh, that 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 he experienced is really striking. I mean, the, the amount of duds and rejections that he got, uh, you can you can imagine that a lot of young adults they reach the age of I, I don't know when he wrote Carrie, how old he was yeah. when he wrote Carrie. But that was his first book. That was the first book yeah. that, that really made it. But he had a nail on his wall that he would um, he would get a rejection letter and he would slap the rejection letter on the wall. And it, he made it sound like it was three or four inches thick yeah. when he was done. So you wonder, and, and again, I, he, the content of what he writes is not my style. I, I don't really consume it. But I just thought the way he thought about the craft and his... Um, it's almost as though he inoculated himself to rejection by virtue of the fact he just kept going. Mm -hmm. And the more he did it, the better he got. And the more feedback he got, the better he got. Uh, And the more experiences he had, the better he got. He talks about taking somewhat um, disparate ideas and conflating them to come up with like with misery he talks about meeting someone and being in a place and he takes he blends all these uh observations and experiences to come up with a story the book misery the book misery yeah yeah that's amazing uh and you know what writing is you you articulated so beautifully like you know what to say germinate in your mind and out your fingertips and and everyone writes pretty much every day exactly yes exactly it's not taught Right. As a course, like I, I grew up and I don't know if your schooling was the same, but I had these classes called English. That's not the same as I've heard of it. That's not I've heard of it. <laughs> that's not the same as a class called writing. <laughs> that's Eng- true. Right. That's, it's a totally true. different thing. English right. is about a language and you, you know what I mean? And writing is about how to actually write. Like, I mean, maybe in the very last year of high school, we had an, we had an optional class called creative writing or writer's craft. I remember that course vaguely and I did not take it, mm-hmm. but there was no other way to sort of have this formative life skill really pulled out you from somehow. Yeah. And this book does a great job of sort of being a basic, welcome, all easy words yeah. way for someone who's interested in writing better to learn how to write better. Right. And by the way, for those that want to learn how to write better, they don't even need to read this book. Ha- the first half of the book is his life story. Right. And then and then the second half of the book is called On Writing. Right. So if I, like I read the first half of the book, I'm like, where's he going to get to the writing part? I mean, I love yeah. his life story because yeah, yeah. it's just so funny and interesting. Yeah, yeah. But but the second half of the book is really all you need if you want to become a better writer. It's yeah, the second that, half of the book that's really about that's the writing. That's true. Part. Yeah, I mean, if you have the time, the whole book is, is I think, is interesting by virtue of the fact that you understand the the uh, the extent to which he reached success, the extent to which he was bruised and battered by the time he reached critical acclaim and, and success. Um, but that you know he's really coming from a place of uh, authenticity and and um, legitimacy by, by virtue of the fact that he really, he had to crawl through a lot of broken glass to get to where he was. Totally. And in the middle of these two halves of the book, he's got this one little interstitial here. I'm trying to use a big word for you. I love that word. What writing is. So it's like a little three page thing in between the, the first half, which is the memoir and the second half, which is the on oh, writing. Is that where he does the, t- the teleporting thing? Yes. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's that. called what writing is. It's page 103. I'll just read the first paragraph. What writing is telepathy, telepathy, Tele- uh, telepathy. Telepathy, of yeah. course. I mispronounced the first word in the in the reading of it. <laughs> telepathy, of course. It's amusing when you stop to think about it. For years, people have argued about whether or not such a thing exists. Folks like J.B. Ryan have busted their brains trying to create a valid testing process to isolate it. And all the time, it's been right there, lying out in the open like Mr. Poe's purloined letter. All the arts depend upon telepathy to some degree, but I believe I believe that writing offers the purest distillation. Perhaps I'm prejudiced, but even if I am, we may as well stick with writing since it's what we came here to talk about. My name is Stephen King. I'm writing the first draft of this part at my desk, the one under the eave on a snowy morning in December of 1997. There are things on my mind. Some are worries, bad eyes, Christmas shopping not started, wife under the weather with the virus. Some are good things. Our younger son made a surprise visit home. I got to play in Vince Taylor's brand new Cadillac with the wallflowers. But right now, all that stuff is up top. I'm in another place, a basement place, where there are lots of lights and images. This is a place I've built for myself over the years. It's a far-seeing place. I know it's a little strange, a little bit of a contradiction, but that far-seeing place should also be a basement place. But that's how it is with me. If you construct your own far-seeing place, you might put it in a treetop or on the roof of the World Trade Center or on the edge of the Grand Canyon. 
That's your little red wagon, as Robert McCammon says. And he goes on and on and on to describe your your thought receiving place, Mm -hmm. being wherever you are right now as you read it. Right. He says, imagine a picture of a rabbit. It's got an eight on the back. Can you picture it? Can you see it? But I'm in a different time, in a different place than you. Right. And it's magical. It's like three pages, like, whoa. Yeah. Yeah. So he got all these quotes from the from the book. I'm going to read some of them to you. Tell me what you think of them. Okay. You, these are the the I went on Goodreads. These are the most popular quotes from on writing. Um, here we go. The road to hell is paved with adverbs. Yes. Uh he is he is a big proponent of the the storyline and the writing it, when you look at it holistically conveying mood and intent and that the dialogue should really be introduced with neil said rich said and you don't need to um you don't need to gussy it up with adverbs because what the is reader, an adverb um Rich said haughtily, uh, haughtily would be, uh, or uh, Neil replied angrily. Mm. It's it's mod, it, it, you're replying in a certain way. Oh, gotcha. Uh, so it, yeah, as he says in the book, most adverbs end in ly, but they 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 don't all, but they modify the verb. They add to and the verb. And you don't need them. And and his contention is that if your writing is truly good, you do not need them. Okay, another quote: Amateurs sit and wait for inspiration. The rest of us just get up and go to work. Uh, yeah, I think he's a yeah he's a big believer in uh, just doing it on mm-hmm. a consistent basis. And you know, like like you just said five minutes ago, we spend so much of our time communicating our ideas and thoughts and information in the written medium. We write all the time. I mean, I, I'm not. I'm not a professional writer. I don't write books. Uh, but for those that are aspiring to that craft, uh, he he just is a big believer in you have to do it and you know do it just like you would uh, you know a- any other prescription that you would take, whether it's you know working out or you know studying mm-hmm. a certain topic, you have to uh, do it consistently and be just very disciplined about it. And um, consistently disciplined on amateur, but you also use that word professional. I'm not a professional writer, but at the same time, you, like everyone listening, like me, we're always texting our friends. We're always right. emailing with our partner. We're always kind of sending a message to a group chat that we're part of or a group. We're always communicating. And if we aren't doing that well, we're miscommunicating. We're sending the wrong emotion. We aren't communicating our true deep love and respect yeah. for something. Like yeah, yeah. it's crazy. Critical sure. that you become a sure. good writer, but it's so hard to do. So, like with the word professional, I mean, we should throw that word in the garbage, and all of us should think about like reading this book as a way to just get better at communicating with our sure. mom over text. Sure. Yeah. Well, yeah, and just communicating clearly. Uh, one of my challenges, I, I just tend to be too. Uh, I use far too many words. Uh, I need to be more disciplined about brevity. Um, I, 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 this just came to me, but, um, I was writing a blog a few days ago and, uh, I asked for some feedback from, uh, my colleagues here because I get a little hand wringing about, well, I've written this, is it clear? Does it convey useful information? Uh, you know, I get a little bit, uh, wrapped around the axle that way. And, uh, one of the one of the people that gave me feedback, I went into her office, uh, Lisa next door, and uh, she said two or three things that led me, made me realize that what I had written wasn't clear in her mind. It mm. doesn't matter if it's clear in my mind. It's got to be clear in her mind. So then she made uh, two or three suggestions, and the Stephen King quote came, uh, which was, I, th- I think he says it in this book, to write is human, to edit is divine. That's right. That's from this book as well. Yeah. A um, couple more quotes from here. Um, can I be blunt on the subject? If you don't have time to read, you don't have the time or the tools to write. Simple as that. I, I love that. I love the, the idea that uh, you that those two mediums are inextricably linked. And if you don't want to invest in uh, consuming writing by reading, then you are probably not going to have much of a chance of being a really effective writer. I mean, Stephen King says, like, I'm a slow reader, which is hard to believe, but he says, I'm a slow reader, yet I still read 70 books a year. Yeah. And I have this story that 
is literally a friend of mine, my friend Kevin, says he went on a vacation to Maine with his wife. They were waiting in line outside of the theater. There was a guy, a few people ahead of them, like re- his nose like buried in a book. They go into the theater. Sure enough, this guy is like still got his nose buried into the book. The lights go down. Everyone watches the movie. The lights go back up. The guy's got his nose buried in the book. They walk into the theater. The guy's w- reading while walking out of the theater. And then his wife says to my friend Kevin, she's like, hey, that's Stephen King. So he's uh, he's walking his talk. He's walking literally, his talk. and he even says, "Here's the last quote I want to read from you from the book." It's related to that exact story. If you expect to succeed as a writer, rudeness should be the second to least of your concerns. The, and he's talking about reading at dinner. He says, "You know, polite people don't yeah. read at dinner." He's like, "But that should be the least yeah. of your concerns. The least of all concern should be polite society and what it expects." If you intend to write as truthfully as you can, your days as a member of polite society are numbered anyway. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I remember reading that and laughing. You know, the other thing that he he uh, shares in there, I I've got a little bit of uh, I call it intellectual insecurity around. You know, I, I get in bed and and I you know I, I go to the bookmark and I read two pages and I'm famous for falling asleep like instantly mm-hmm. you know, within a couple minutes. And I got to thinking, if I read, and then the next day, of course, I can't read, I can't remember what the second page was, so I got to go back. And like, I'm reading one page a night here. This is going to take me a long time. So uh, I commute to my office um, on road bike and mountain bike. And, you know, if I'm on a business trip and renting a car, uh, rather than just listen to music constantly, I would so much rather listen to an audio book. So I was, I was kind of relieved when King talked about uh, taking in audiobooks yeah. in the car, and uh, I, since I've gone to audiobooks, my rate of uh, book consumption has uh, gone up by. Not, I can't even say an order of magnitude. I think it's two orders of magnitude. That's interesting. You're also making me think that you know one of the values of the, our show is real books have real pages. We have this mm-hmm. statement. It's a bit. I have to be careful because, like, you know, we. Just, I just believe that there's so much thought. I've seen it from the publishers that go into like what shape the book is, what the smell is, what size the paper is, what font they're choosing, how is it cut? You know, all those sensations get neutered when we just go to e-readers. Right. And I really love those sensations. That's why I like carrying a bunch of books around. They have different sides. They have different feelings. Right. But now I don't know where audio fits on that spectrum. Yeah. No, and and, and I definitely have that, uh, you know, one one of the reasons why I have your book uh, sitting here on my desk is, I you know, commuting back and forth and on my bike and and I took I, and one of the great things was listening to the author read their own stuff. Yeah, it's like and, a whole... and listening to you read your own book was there's a there's a there's a peculiar delight in that that the inflection and the timing and that the uh, these are your ideas that are coming off your lips. That's um, it's really fun to listen to Malcolm Gladwell read his own stuff too. By the way, and and luckily for me, in in the book The Happiness Equation, I did not use the word telepathy once. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I would have totally for, mispronounced it. Um, there's this thing that happens in bookstores, and I don't know if you've seen it, Rich. I've always noticed this. I've always noticed this, and I've always wondered what are people doing, which is they pick up a copy of my book or any book in the bookstore. I just know some, and you know what they do? Here, I'll do it. They grab the book and they go like this. They fan it. They do this fan. It's yeah. like a one second read of the book. I'm like, yeah. what are you doing? You yeah. aren't reading anything. The world's fastest reader. Nothing happened in yeah. that one second. Why are you doing that? And and then I read something on page 129 of On Writing. This is Stephen King. You can tell without even reading if the book you've chosen is apt to be easy or hard, right? Easy books contain lots of short paragraphs, including dialogue paragraphs. talking about the white space. Yeah, which may only be a word too long. Here's the best metaphors coming here. And lots of white space. They're as airy as Dairy Queen ice cream cones. (laughs) Hard books, like this Barbara Demick book, Nothing to Envy, which is a hard book, I'd say. It says, Stephen King says, they're full of ideas, narration, description. They have a stouter look, a packed look. Paragraphs are almost as important as how they look as for what they say Mm -hmm. because they are maps of intent. Yeah. Now we understand. Yeah. yeah. Now we understand the flip. That's what they're they're, they're looking to just kind of get the – yeah, the, the print gestalt of, uh, is this a light, airy ice cream cone, or is this going to be a schlag? Not only that, but I'm almost positive that 99% of the time, they're looking for it to be a light, airy ice cream cone. Right. No one's looking right. for like, oh, please, I really want another gun, German steel. Like, <laughs> give me give me the thousand pound brick. You yeah, know, no one's yeah, asking. No, Jared Diamond had nothing to do with this book. <laughs> this is just my style. Um, so 
this is this is a great book. You've chosen such a beautiful array. And I, oh, I was trying you. to think about them as I was on the plane on the way here. I'm like, Nothing to Envy by Barbara Ademek. Then The Blessing of a Skin Knee by Wendy Mogul. Then On Writing by Stephen King. And I was thinking, what are the big themes that tie these things together? I thought of two. Number one is it seems to me you are a gobbler. You are like thirsty for knowledge and new experiences. There's so many different book topics here. You're the president of the largest speaking agency in the Western United States speaking. You're thirsty for knowledge. I saw that on, on your website. I hope that's right. And so I just know your body language. But, but I want to say, Rich, how do you think adults should think about their own personal development in the most macro sense of the word? You're done school. You're in a job, maybe. Yeah. Now, how do you think about your own self learning? Um, my my wife and I look at our fathers uh, and talk about how they, uh, and it, it's not unique to them, but um, we one of the things that we admire about them is that they are lifelong learners. That they they don't have this mentality of oh okay well I, you know I I got my degree I graduated you, know, you sort of spike the ball and I'm done that they're constantly trying to learn um, about they're, they're embracing new ideas new technologies uh, and they may not have it wired tight but they're they're intellectually curious and um, I I hope that. Uh, it, it, you know, to, to some degree, the older I get, um, the more I realize I know nothing. Like in, in, when you look at the, the, the human experience and the amount of, uh, the, you know, sort of what I have absorbed intellectually, um, the, more I'm, the more I know, the more I know I, I, I have infinitely more to learn. The more I know the more I know, the less I know kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it, the more I realize it, the less one, I know. one uh, you know, phrase that I'm, I'm famous for quoting is rising from the level of uh, unconscious incompetency to conscious incompetency. Mm -hmm. So I, I'd, I'd like to think at, at a bare minimum that I've, I've reached uh, an age and a, and a perspective where I, I now know I know nothing. Yeah. Not nothing, but pretty close to it. No, it's beautiful. I actually feel like that's a great place to finish off. So Rich Gibbons, thank you so much for being on Three Bucks. Well, thank you for having me. It's been uh, just a real treat and uh, I'm honored to be asked. Thanks a lot. Take care. The more I know, the more I know that I know nothing. And isn't that a great metaphor for our time on this planet and a reminder just to be humble, to be humble in whatever you're doing today and grateful for whatever you have. Thank you so much to the incredibly articulate and interesting and inspiring Rich Gibbons for giving us three more books, three books on our quest to uncover the 1,000 most formative books of all time over the next 15 years. Today, Rich gave us number 963, Nothing to Envy by Barbara Demick, number 962, The Blessing of a Skin Knee by Wendy Mogul, and number 961, On Writing by Stephen King. As a reminder, if you want to see any of the books in our top 1,000 so far, you just go to 3books.co. That's 3-B-O-O-K-S dot C-O. And then we have a page called The Top 1,000. And this is the literal page where it's got the countdown of every single book, every single formative book mentioned on 3Books so far, beginning with, of course, number 1,000, where the sidewalk ends by Shel Silverstein, which came to us from my wife, Leslie, in chapter one of the show. So this is the conclusion of chapter 14. And guess where we're going for chapter 15? Yes, on the next full moon, we're flying over to Detroit, Michigan. We're going to the top of an old Art Deco building downtown into a radio station where we're going to interview someone who I think you'll find very special. Uh, now, I won't say his name right now, but I'm going to give you a gigantic hint, okay? You should be able to get it off this hint. We'll see. 
But if, if not, no worries. No book guilt, no book shame. He is the author of Tuesdays with Maury and The Five People You Meet in Heaven. And if that is interesting to you, then I will see you on the next new moon. No, no, it's the full moon next time. See you on the next full moon for the next chapter of Three Books. And now, <laughs> if you've made it to this far in the podcast... I'd like to welcome you back to the end of the podcast club. This is the club where I talk directly to you. You talk directly to me. We have a little fun little dessert sort of, you know, squeezed out. I'm picturing one of those like icing things that you squeeze and you put on a cake. Um, We have a little dessert kind of squeezed out at the end of the plate. Just if you want a tiny little finishing move before you get on with your day. So as always, let's start off by going to the phones. Remember, give me a call anytime at one eight three three read a lot. I love listening to your voicemails, and we love playing them on the show. So let's go to the phones. Hey Neil, this is Bo Boswell from Nashville, Tennessee. Um, you know, I, I have to admit, when I first saw that this last episode was with uh, with the Uber driver Vish. Um, I wasn't excited at first. I, I didn't think it'd be very interesting and I wouldn't get much out of it, but it turned out to be my favorite episode so far. That Vish had a lot of inspiring thoughts about serving others and doing your best, and it, I just thought it was a meaningful episode and a great conversation to, uh, to overhear. So thanks for giving us the chance to hear that. Um, you know, thinking about what my own three books would be, I'd, I'd have to start with On Writing by Stephen King. This, this book not only helps me with my own writing, but also taught me the importance of reading. And I think I read more now and get more out of reading because of this book. Uh, the second would be How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big by Scott Adams. Uh, this book taught me the importance of embracing failure, which I know Seth Godin talked about. Um, it helped me establish a routine uh, with, and uh, maintain good health. And it, it got me interested in utilizing affirmations, which I thought were, were kind of neat. And then my third book would be Search Inside Yourself by Chade Ming Tan. And this was the first book that I read on mindfulness and emotional intelligence. And it's helped me understand the importance of being mindful and listening to others and, and practicing gratitude. And all three of these books have taught me something that I actively practice on a daily basis. And I, I realize that each of them are part memoir, part self-improvement. Uh, in, in essence, that's what I get out of your podcast. We get to hear about your guests' experience and what they learn from each of the books that help shape them. So I wanted to thank you again for the work you put into these podcasts and for letting us be part of the conversation. It means a lot, and I, I can't wait to hear more. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Bo. Uh, Bo Boswell. What a great name. Bo Boswell. I feel like I could say that all day. Bo Boswell. Bo Boswell. Bo Boswell. Um, for calling from Nashville, Tennessee, you gave us an incredible voicemail. For those listening, this is the perfect voicemail, right? You say something you like or don't like about the show, so a tiny piece of feedback, and then you go jump into your three most formative books. Because we all love listening to books. That's why we're here. And you gave us On Writing by Stephen King. How appropriate that we just discussed On Writing by Stephen King today uh, with Rich Gibbons. And then you gave us How to Fail at Almost Everything and Still Win Big by Scott Adams, of course, the author of Dilbert, and Search Inside Yourself by Chade Ming Tan. I love what you said. These books each gave you something that you still use today, whether that was the importance of reading, establishing, you know, affirmations, um, and, you know, just getting in more into mindfulness and meditation. Beautiful. Part memoir, part self-improvement. You said that's what this podcast is. I absolutely agree. It's part memoir, part self-improvement. We're talking to people about their books, but we're trying to get deeper into the sort of the things that they're using, the ideas, the, the 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 big issues in our lives that we're all wrestling with, right? We're all wrestling with a lot of these things: attention, parenting, focus, um, ambition, contentment. There's just a million things that we're always trying to get better at, and I hope that this show can be part of that journey. And thank you so much, Bo. Your call means a lot, and I really appreciate you calling in. Again, I love hearing from you. So if you're listening to this and you're wondering, I don't know if I should call Neil. You know, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I don't really like my voice or I don't really know if I have something to say or I don't think I can say it succinctly. Just call. Seriously, just call. We'd love to hear from you. It's one eight three three read a lot. There's no such thing as a bad call. Every single voicemail I've received so far has been a pleasure to listen to. So please, 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 if you're wondering if you should or not, call us. one eight three three read a lot. R-E-A-D-A-L-O-T. Okay, big thank you to Bo. Now let's move on to the review. 
the review of the podcast. You guys remember the review we had last chapter, chapter 13? Remember that one where it was the person from the airport bookstore and they're really taking me to task on, on sort of talking about the big pile at the airport bookstores? Well, one of my old bosses back like 15, 20 years ago at Walmart used to say to me, you know what, Neil? I won't do his like Southern sort of Arkansas accent. Okay, I will not do that. But he was like, Neil, um, if you ever give someone bad news or bad feedback, make sure that you surround it in good news. Tell them something good first, then tell them the bad thing or the thing they need to get better at, and then tell them the good thing. Well, I'm going to do that to myself and to all of us at Three Books this week by going the exact antithesis, the opposite of, of that sort of scathing review that we read last, last chapter. And I'm going to read you this one from Chrissy Da Silva, who left it on our YouTube channel. We are posting the podcast on YouTube. So if you aren't near your phone and you want to listen to it on YouTube, you can just type in three books with Neil Pasricha there. Chrissy left this review for us on YouTube. Three books. You have forever changed my life. And by the way, after every sentence, there's all these exclamation marks. I won't read them. You have forever changed my life. From the moment I heard about the book of awesome, I became obsessed. I bought all the books. I listened to all the podcasts. I shared the book of awesome as an icebreaker in all of my classes. I have gifted the books to family, friends, and teachers. I have a mason jar filled with all the awesome things that happen in a year. And I read them at the end of the year to remind myself of all the good things. You have forever changed my outlook on life. And I hope that by sharing, I have encouraged someone to change the way they see things too. The three books podcasts are truly my favorite. I am an avid reader and I always look for new books to dive into. So far, my favorite guest has been Judy Bloom as she shaped my childhood and I've passed on the wonderful books she recommended to my own children. Thank you for all that you do. Exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. Chrissy De Silva, you made my day. You made all of us here at Three Books Smile. Thank you so much for leaving this review of the podcast. Please drop us a line, get in touch, and we will mail you a signed book for the review. Just a way to say thanks. So let's close off. How are we going to close off? With the, with the word of the podcast. How are we going to do that with Rich? I mean, this guy is super articulate. Listen, here are a few. Here are just a few of the words he mentioned on this chapter. The list of uh, August was likely going to go the way of the buggy whip, an embodiment of the, uh, the, the, the phenotype. And, and I, don't, I don't mean it to be a pejorative. When the armistice was signed, rabbinical teachings, there's ballast around that, gyrating with... Uh, approach du jour, Hobson's choice, fiefdom of impact. Oh my gosh. Were you thinking what I was like, buggy whip, phenotype, pejorative, like, like rabbi, rabbinical? Like, like, rabbi, I looked that up, rabbinical. I was like, uh, of, you know, uh, here it is, uh, relating to rabbis or Jewish law, R rabbinical, rabbinical. I mean, amazing, but I'm not going to pick that word. No. The word I was really interested in, I was like, never heard before. Now, I don't, I don't know if, I've, if I'll hear it again. I think I might, though, you know, how the words sort of appear to you, is, is Hobson's choice. Now, I know technically it's two words, but it is a phrase. Hobson's choice. What is Hobson's choice? Hobson's choice, which is H-O-B-S-O-N, Hobson's choice, is a choice of taking what is available or nothing at all. Okay, where did this come from? Well, it came from, this is really interesting, uh, in the late 16th century, when Thomas Hobson worked as a licensed carrier of passengers, letters, and parcels in between Cambridge and, and London, England. This guy was like a little shipper, like a, maybe an early taxi cab driver kind of thing. So he kept horses for this purpose, and he rented them out to university students when he wasn't using them. If you are studying at Cambridge and you want to go home to London, you rent one of Hobson's horses. But the students always wanted their favorite horses. And consequently, a few of Hobson's horses became overworked. So to correct the situation, Hobson began a strict rotation system, giving each student the choice of taking the horse closest to the stable door or no horse at all. This rule became known as Hobson's choice, and soon people were using that term to mean no choice at all in any kind of situation. Hobson's choice or no choice at all. I love that. And I loved this conversation with Rich, and I love the conversation that we are developing together here on Three Books. If you are listening and here at the end of the Podcast Club, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your love, your focus, 
and your attention in this world where content is widely available and yet we have chosen to spend this special time together. Take care and remember, until next time, you are what you eat and you are what you read. Take care and I'll see you soon.